Hello, I'm here with uh, Warren Mosler. He is a friend, full disclosure. He is also uh, president of Valence, which is a financial services management uh, company. Uh, he's been a market practitioner, economist, and um, also a mini celebrity because he's been written up in the New York Times. So um, I decided to uh, bring him in and, and, and interview him. Warren, thanks for, uh, for coming around. Let's start with um, the fundamentals. Uh, you are considered to be one of the so-called fathers of modern monetary theory. Do you want to just explain what that is for those that haven't followed you on the blogs, in the blogosphere? The government is the uh, only legal issuer of the thing that it demands for payment of taxes. And, and I guess what distinguishes it, uh, in, in, in at least in practical policy terms, is the fact that yeah. um, we don't operate under a so-called gold standard constraint. Uh, this whole notion of fiscal uh, sustainability, yeah. or uh, that's, that's not an, uh, an issue under your, in, in, right. under your but, perspective. But we could operate under a gold standard, and that would be a self-imposed constraint. Yes. The government could say uh, anybody who works for the government has to stand on one foot. I mean, there's all kinds of silly things we could do to ourselves. But like, we, like a gold standard. But, but we don't have a gold standard now. We, we effectively right, liberated right. ourselves. And right. that, in theory, gives policymakers a lot more um, freedom to right. uh, con construct policies which they generate full employment, and, 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 yeah. and yet we don't do those, those sorts uh, yeah, of things. Yeah, I like to say it opens up their options. Yeah. Far beyond what are the imagined options today in, in Washington. And, and, and you've discussed that, and um, you were described as a deficit lover with a following. And I think, I, I, I've always said it's a little bit unfair because I don't think you're a, a deficit lover or a deficit hater. I think it's more fair to say that you actually uh, challenge the notion that a deficit per se is a good or a bad thing. It, it's more of a barometer than anything else. Right. Well, it is what it is. It, there's no morality assigned to yeah. a deficit. And, yeah. and we have this Atlantic uh, article uh, out t today um, which uh, describes, it's, it, they have a picture of uh, uh, Alan uh, Simpson and, and uh, um, uh, Mr. Bowles, uh, the Simpson-Bowles Commission. Yeah. Um, uh, there, there's this notion that somehow we're getting the deficit under control. Uh, this is a great thing. This is why stock markets are, are yeah. ebullient. And, uh, um, yeah, and, and you have a somewhat different view about well, that. Well, yeah, that's, that's what ends the business cycle. Yeah. Th this is the real deficit crisis is when they get too small. So, for example, in 2006, the deficit got too small, under 1% of GDP wasn't enough to support the credit structure, and it all came apart. You could say the same thing about um, uh, the late 1990s, uh, when we allowed the deficit to go into surplus. The uh, economy was sustained by the private sector, doing its own deficit spending at 7% of GDP, which was totally unsustainable, and, and triggered that collapse that we handed uh, President Bush. And before that, um, I'll get, get my year straight here, we had the uh, deficit got too small under Bush Sr. with the Bush tax hikes caused a big uh, recession of uh, 1990. And there seems to be this implicit notion that somehow uh, public debt is inherently more uh, destabilizing than private sector debt. Right. Um, that somehow it's okay for us to run up loads of private credit even though arguably that's what created the foundations for the 2008 crisis. Yeah, I remember that in the 90s when they were saying, you know, the private debt growing at 7% is sustainable, but a public debt of 1% or 2% is not sustainable. Well, of course, it's exactly the opposite. Because, right. of course, uh, a government being the monopoly yeah. issuer of the currency. Right. And in fact, if you look uh, closely at the accounts, and as a simple point of logic, government has to spend first and then collect taxes. It has to spend first and then borrow. Okay. Otherwise, how are the dollars to pay taxes and to lend to the government going to be out there? It's like the um, football stadium. It doesn't collect the tickets first and then sell them. Okay? Yeah. Anybody who issues anything has to get it out there first and then collect it. Where the users, all the other people, they have to get the dollars first before they can spend them. And you described this. You, you actually wrote a, a book, uh, um, the, the uh, Seven uh, Innocent uh, Deadly Sins, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> about uh, which economic policymakers follow. And, 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 and you've used that scoreboard analogy before. And you've talked about you know, how the, effectively the Federal Reserve acts as the, uh, the, the scorekeeper. Right, the right. So if we're all in a card game and I'm the scorekeeper, how many points do I have? Go, I don't have any points. Well, then how do I give you 100? I just write them down. And do I have fewer points after I give you 100? No. So the Federal Reserve is an agent of Congress. The Treasury and the Fed are both agents of Congress. And the Federal Reserve is the scorekeeper for the dollar. When they spend, they just credit an account. They write the number down, and the account gets larger, which Chairman Bernanke has told us many times. So he was on um, 
public television, they were asking him where all the hundreds of billions for the banks came from, and he said, we just used a computer to mark up the numbers in their accounts. And he's exactly right. And so when the, when the government spends, they add to numbers to accounts, and when they tax, they subtract. They don't give anything up when they spend, and they don't get anything when they tax. Because it's unlike, say, when we operated under a gold standard, there's not a stock of gold that sort of goes up and down. And I, I mean, a lot of the right. economic terms that we have are, are, are predicated on this, this gold standard type thingy, where we have stocks right, of gold right. and flows of money, where gold literally flows from one country to another. And we don't have that under uh, the, right. the current system. Before 1934, when the Fed credited an account, and you had a number in that account, you were entitled to cash it in for a gold at $35 an ounce. And that was a risk, and so they had to operate under that risk and that constraint. Now today, the only thing you're gonna get, if you go to the Fed with a $10 bill, the only thing you're gonna get is two fives, right? They'll make change, but you're not gonna get any gold or anything else. Okay, so let's go to the, uh, the policy considerations. Um, obviously, we had a huge crisis in 2008. It was, first of all, though, in, in, in contrast to most economic crises, it was a financial crisis, which then spilled right. over into the real economy. Right. And um, you have said to me many times and to others that you know, it could have been arrested to quite easily if the right mix of fiscal policies had been introduced at that time. What would you yeah. have done if you were, say, Treasury Secretary or even President? Mm. Well, in the second quarter of 08, we had had a flat economy and we had $170 billion of stimulus tax cut spending increase. We added $170 billion to the deficit proactively and we grew it 2.5%. And I was talking to Kareem Boston, who's my partner and very good, and he says, you know, the third quarter, doesn't look so good when this runs out. He, he doesn't see any support anymore. You know, what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? I said, well, let's just do another one. How hard is this? They just did one and it worked. They did nothing. They just watched the whole thing collapse. It was nine months later before we got the too little, too late, not enough to get us out of it, Obama stimulus package. And I, I just couldn't believe this political decision to do nothing. You know, but it happened. And if we had taken, say, a number like closer to, say, one and a half, two trillion, which was, we, we lost about a trillion dollars of economic output. Yeah. And if we had matched that with a, uh, an economic stimulus of that uh, magnitude, yeah. we probably could have arrested the problem. Uh, what, do, what do you say, though, for example, about all of the toxic assets that were, that were um, supposedly like a cancer within the financial system? What's your, your, your response to that? Hmm? Uh, you know, I don't have a particularly strong response. In, in, in August of 08, all we had to do was suspend collecting payroll taxes, have a full FICA tax suspension. And then the average family would have taken home an extra $600 a month. Same people, just stop taking it out of their paycheck. And they would have been able to make their mortgage payments, right, if they wanted to on their houses. Yeah. Uh, if you looked at the housing market before that, delinquencies weren't good, but um, the, house, the mortgages were predicated on incomes. And what happened was 8 million people lost their jobs all at once and couldn't make their payments, and suddenly all those loans became toxic waste. So what's the difference between you know, a triple A loan and a toxic waste? With the triple A, the guy's making his mortgage payment. With toxic waste, he can't make his mortgage payment. There's no other difference. At the bottom of the pile, either the guy's making his mortgage payment or either. And so we created this whole financial crisis by allowing sales to collapse uh, and jobs to be lost. And, um, because all the credit cards were taken away. Okay, up until 08, the last couple of years, it was private sector credit expansion that was driving the economy. Once that collapsed because of Bear Stearns, Lehman, financial crisis, whatever, the, the obvious thing to do is to just stop taking all this money out of paychecks of people working for a living, and I don't see any moral hazard in doing that, mm -hmm. uh, so that they can spend and make their payments out of income instead of out of debt. Yeah. It's like, what's so, bad about that. Nice, progressive, bottom-up, you know, populist approach. <laughs> who, who more than the people working for a living, you know, deserve to be able to buy the output they're producing, right? And then that, of course, spills over into everybody else, including all the state tax revenues and all that that was lost. So, I don't know if I directly answered your question. No, you did, and, and actually you gave yeah. me a nice, very kindly gave me a nice segue into something else yeah. I, you wanted to talk about, I wanted to talk about, which was uh, the, your job guarantee idea. Because obviously, yeah. as you say, uh, you, we ideally, what we want to move towards is an income and employment-based uh, um, uh, economic policy as opposed to a private yeah. credit-led economy. And you've had some proposals, yeah. um, such as the job guarantee program, which would uh, achieve right. that. So right. do you want to have elaborate yeah. on that? And, and just in the background, let's not forget that jobs are a cost of production. Yeah. The benefit is the output, right? Not, yeah. Not the jobs. If you ask most people, not I know you're, you and I are different, <laughs> would you rather 
work today or take the day off at full pay. Yeah. Quite a few people would take the day off at full pay. Except so unless you got a job like be, this. Because you need <laughs> to buy things, right? Yeah. And so the job is really the cost to all of us of what we have to do. And, but it's become, we've set it up so it's difficult to get jobs, so it's difficult. And we've turned it all somehow into a benefit. You know, mm -hmm. somebody created jobs. It's like, that's okay, there's plenty of jobs. Anyway, so um, to, to get to your point, right now, we need the same thing we needed in 2008. We should just fully suspend these FICA taxes. Of course, instead of year-end, we increased them, and now we've seen GDP go down steadily. Yeah. 1.8 instead of 3.1. It's been revised down this quarter. I heard as low as 0.5 for Q2. Interesting that we're still forecasting three months ago, and we call it a forecast. Yeah, yeah. We're forecasting the past. <laughs> with, and, and, That's usually it's more accurate in it, theory yeah, that and way. Yeah, and even then, it's not all that accurate. So, no. you know, we're supposed to forecast the future. Let's see these people forecast the past. I can't even do that. All right, so, uh, so let's say we do the full FICA suspension. The people working all get extra income, and then sales go up. Now, the, the, the general idea is that capitalism runs on sales. So the, the restaurant that's full of people doesn't lay off the bus boy. Okay? Yeah. I don't care. No matter what the regulations or the taxes yeah. are, you know, yeah. the, the, I don't care the, if they the confidence fairy doesn't yeah. really apply in this situation. You get a full restaurant, people will um, yeah. uh, they'll hire, keep hiring waiters. Yeah, you can hate the government, tea party, you're not going to let the bus boy go if you're full. Yeah. If you're empty, you're not going to hire an extra bus boy. Yeah. Okay, even if you get a tax break or something, you're just going to keep the money. Okay, you've got to get, so employment is always a function of sales. And the fewer the people you can hire, the better for the same output. That's called productivity. Because then we can have more and more businesses, more and more services, more and more good things happening. You know, everything, theater, you know, you name it, arts, medical research. We can have more and more of that if businesses could only hire fewer people to do the same job. It just frees people up for more and more things. That's productivity. That's what makes us all rich. So what we want to do is restore sales output which restores employment right right and so you have a payroll tax suspension payroll tax holiday and suddenly that starts happening now if we want more public sector uh, goods and services then you wouldn't do that instead you would just hire people directly into the public sector and that's a political decision if you want to build a high-speed rail you don't give everybody a tax cut you but I think the point about the correct. job guarantee program so, yeah, so is it's a permanent institutional feature. Let me circle back to that. Okay. okay. So here's the problem. you got all these people in the private sector go out, and, and now the private sector does not like to hire people who have been unemployed. They just don't like it. You know, we can spend hours going into all the studies and why, but they don't do it. And there was a famous ad not too long ago on one of the internet ads. says It was an employment agency that said um, out-of-work people you know, don't apply. This, this jobs are available only for people already working. <laughs> it's a, okay. it's, it's a, a, what the economists like to call a negative externality. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. And so what we need to be able to do is transition people from unemployment to private sector employment when the, when the demand is there. Otherwise, you get labor bottlenecks and you get a high NARU and you're still at 7 or 8% unemployment. Yep. You've just ratcheted yourself down and you've lost all that you know, real output. Because effectively, the, the long-term unemployed become less employable the longer they are unemployed. Even, yeah, yeah, and even like a couple of months makes a huge yeah. difference. And so what I've proposed is offering a transition job, which would be a permanent institutional structure, to anybody willing and able to work. And I'm just going to toss out a wage like $10 an hour, and you could include childcare and whatever, medical benefits, that's fine. Uh, and, and that job is available to anybody willing and able to work. And, and it will be considered a transition job. So we'll be, right now, the unemployed would be able to take this job to show what they can do. They come in on time, they take a bath every day, they don't get in fights, and this makes them attractive to the private sector to hire. And then they will transition to private sector work. They and effectively you, become shovel-ready labor, I think, is it? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if you look at a buffer stock, yeah. it's a buffer stock policy. Right now, we have unemployed as our buffer stock. When the economy gets bad, it fills up. The unemployment fills up. When the economy gets good, it's supposed to feed back in, but it doesn't. It's like if you use butter for a buffer stock, but you didn't keep it cold. Farm, yeah. All the butter stock would come in, and then it goes rancid, and then the economy is strong, and you, it doesn't function as a buffer stock. And so, as a result, the price of butter goes up. Yeah, and there's shortages. Of that. Yeah. yeah, and you're yeah. limited in what you can do because all that butter's gone bad. So, you, to keep the labor fresh and liquid, right, to, uh, you, you keep it employed. And active, and that's all you have to do. And now the question is, how large would this transition job be? Well, it needs to be smaller than it needs to be. It's the purpose of it is a um, you know an inflation, anti-inflation buffer stock, 
yet, right? And so how, how many people do you need unemployed to act as a price anchor? It functions as a price anchor. And the answer is not that many. Under Clinton, we had unemployment down under 4% and inflation was still going down. So I would say we could keep fiscal policy loose enough, low enough taxes, high enough public spending, where you'd only have maybe 2 or 3% of the population at any time in this transition job. This is separate from regular public sector service. If you want people doing normal public sector work, you hire them at full wages, benefits, whatever you're supposed to do. This is just a transition job. So, and, and effectively, it would substitute for a lot of the things that we have today, like uh, food stamps, unemployment insurance, uh, because there's always this yeah. question that people say, well, you know, the, the, yeah. the, we, we, we have this but, question about involuntary versus voluntary yeah. employment. So a lot of yeah. the times you... I, I would leave all those programs in place, Yeah. add this, and see what happens. Yeah. My instincts and my experience tells me 90% of the people would take this, earn the money, and, and not be interested in those other programs. And I think it's also, you, you mentioned something else which is very important, which is that it acts as an inflationary anchor because right. effectively what this uh, program does is set a floor. But you've also pointed out to me in the past right. that you don't want to outbid the private sector for, right. uh, for, for, for workers. So that, for example, some guy from the private sector sees someone working in this program at, say, $10 an hour and outbids at, say, $15 an hour. The government's not going to come back and say, no, we want you to stay at $17 an hour because that's precisely the thing that could right. trigger an inflationary spiral. Right. And look, you could walk into this program and say, we're going to pay $30 an hour for anybody who wants a job. And you're just going to empty out everybody in the fast food industry. You're going to have 50 million people show. You know, it's disruptive. It doesn't, it's yeah. not the point. You want it to be as high as you can make it, but you want it to be low enough so it's not disruptive to the private sector at this point in time. Because right now, there's no point in uh, disrupting what we have. Now and it's going to. I think at ten dollars an hour, it's non-disruptive. It's going to function as an effective buffer stock. It's going to be an effective transition job, but it needs to be coupled with either a tax cut or a spending increase, it's a larger deficit, so that there's demand out there, so that these people will get hired to meet the demand. And I've noticed that you've you've talked a lot about tax cuts and 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 uh, or uh, spending increase. Right. In other words, you focused on the the role of fiscal policy. Yeah. Now. The markets these days experience, so are experiencing this sort of um, crazy uh, schizophrenic behavior. Uh, ev they hang on the word of everything that the Fed chairman says. Yeah. Um, you, I think, have taken the view that uh, monetary policy, uh, things like QE, quantitative easing, are gimmicks, and that actually it's fiscal policy that drives uh, um, e economic policy, or it should do anyway. Right. I did a cartoon once years ago for a Bretton Woods conference where uh, I had Alan Greenspan in the car seat, in the kid's car seat in the car with the steering wheel, you know wasn't attached to anything. <laughs> and then Congress is, the congressman is there at the steering wheel with his hands out the window, not holding onto it, looking over at Alan and going, nice driving while the car's <laughs> going over the cliff, right? So, um, but that's exactly what it is. You know, it's uh, monetary policy is the kid with the steering wheel that's not attached to anything. And, if, and how do you know that? Just look at the details of what actually happens when you do quantitative easing. You buy treasury securities. So what does that mean? It means you go into the market and you offer a price where people are indifferent between that treasury security and holding cash. And what is a treasury security? A treasury security is a dollar balance in an account at the Fed. It's called a securities account. Okay, it's, they give it a fancy name, treasury security, but it's like a savings account at a normal bank. If you buy a treasury security, you send the money, the Fed money, you get it back with interest. If you go to a commercial bank, you buy a CD, you send the money, you get it back with interest. It's the exact same thing. So the Fed is a bank, and they have two types of accounts. A normal bank would call them checking and savings. The Fed calls them reserve accounts, Federal Reserve Bank, and securities accounts, treasury securities. Okay? But they're just checking and savings. And so when, you, when the Fed buys securities, they go into the market, they offer a price where somebody decides, you know, instead of this securities account, I'd rather have my money in a reserve account. And the Fed debits their securities account, makes it smaller, and credits their reserve account, makes it larger. They're both dollars at the Fed. It's effectively swapping assets on the balance yeah. of the balance sheet of the Fed. It's and, not actually yeah. creating new net aggregate demand. Yeah, so if you had a million dollars here in your securities and you sell it to the Fed, now you have a million dollars in your reserve account. Both of them were bank deposits at the Fed. There's functionally no difference. And the only reason they call it printing money is because they don't count the securities accounts as money, but they do count the reserve accounts. So it's an accounting now, why do they do that? Yeah. Because back in 1933, the reserve accounts were convertible into gold and the securities accounts were not. So again, it's another legacy of the gold standard. Yeah. Everything always goes up back to that. But if you account securities as money, which under the broader aggregates of S&L, they are counted as money, then quantitative easing doesn't 
print money. Yeah. And I might add that you're, you're not saying this from the perspective of being some sort of you know, pinhead ivory tower uh, yeah. academic economist. You've actually seen this uh, from an operational standpoint because you yeah. worked in, the, in banking departments for many, many years. In fact, your sure. whole, the whole base of your theory came from watching, observing you know, all the operations of banks. Uh, from yeah, this is just all simple operational things that all the staffers at the Fed understand and none of the appointees. You ask the staffers at monetary operations, monetary affairs, uh, you start talking like this, they speak your language immediately, and yeah, of course. And then you ask them, well, how many people on the FOMC understand this? And they go, zero. They just don't get it. And so there's this huge disconnect between the senior staffers at the Fed and the political appointees. And, I, I, and, and one other point on China that I'd like to get to, it, yeah. which is that, um, um, given that you have this, uh, uh, the, the operations you describe, we don't have to worry about um, China running off and creating a dollar crash or a credit markets crisis because uh, we owe them all this money. I, what I always like to say is it's not the denomination of the debt holder, it's the denomination of the debt, which is the yeah. most important consideration. So, so China has, I don't know, what, two trillion in savings accounts at the Fed or something like that? It's like, okay, you know, what are they going to do? Uh, what would happen if they called up to, sit, to check their balance, you know, they went online and they saw, uh, you know, some kind of, it went blank. They called the Fed, and they, well, I'm sorry, we've had a computer error, we've lost all the accounts, records, they're just gone. It's like, what do they have? They have nothing. All they have is data on the Fed's computer. What are they going to do, call the manager? I mean, so who's taking the risk here? They've traded all these real goods and services in return for just numbers on the Fed spreadsheet. Japan's been doing it since World War II, right? And Helmut Schmidt made the same point recently uh, in an article okay. in the Handelsblatt. He, he commented about Germany. He sort of said, I'm not sure that Germany exporting its, uh, all of its output in, in exchange for financial claims is actually a, a, a good trade for, uh, for Germany. Hmm. He must have read my book. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is called Real Terms of Trade, right? Yep. It's, been, you know, it's not a secret or anything. And now in the old days, of course, instead of numbers here, China would have had gold. But now they don't. Now all they have are these credit balances on some computer. At, at the, at the United States Federal Reserve. And uh, what I always like to say is, okay, if they decided that they didn't want to hold dollars anymore, then they might decide to shift it into another currency. So you get this one-off um, portfolio yeah. preference shift. So the dollar gets weaker, our exports probably would go, uh, would, would, would increase in that sort of a situation. So our balance of well, payments vision would change. Yeah, so everybody says, well, what happens if China decides to sell all the dollars? So yeah. they, let's say they want to buy euro. Right. So they sell their dollars and buy euro with a bank. So we would move the dollars from China's checking account at the Fed to that bank's checking account, whoever it is. And we're done. Now the European Central Bank does the opposite. They move euros from you know, the bank's account to China's account. And they say, well, it'll make the dollar go down. They say, well, what's our policy? Okay, we've been sending trade negotiators to China for years telling them they have to have their currency stronger, which means the dollar weaker. Okay, so, you know, and so what is what is it you want? Do you want the dollar to go up or down? Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Whenever I say that to the person who's explaining this to me, they usually like just back off and have no answer. So the, the same people who are worried about the dollar going down are criticizing China because the, the dollar's, uh, because they want the dollar to go down because <laughs> the dollar's too strong. Yeah. So it's like, you can't have it both ways. You yeah. pick, you, before you ask me the question, pick a policy. Yeah. You know, pick one or the other and then I'll, address, I'll answer your question. But you can't have it both ways. How would you actually impart these ideas in an educational sense? What should we be doing? We have a bunch of young scholars. Um, you know, how, how do we get this, this kind of, these kinds of ideas out to disseminate them a little bit better? Here we have a situation of unthinkable unemployment right now, really unthinkable unemployment. And what are we doing? We're raising taxes and cutting spending. We think the deficit's too large and needs to come down. You know, we're celebrating a lower deficit. Yeah. We're making unemployment worse. Okay, and, and in fact, we need to go the other way. And so the reason this MMT understanding is critical is because we're going the other way. We're destroying our civilization and we're, we're in real terms, robbing our children's future. That's the real intergenerational theft, as opposed to the usual one where we've oh, been yeah. talking about the deficits getting larger and stealing from our grandchildren, actually. Yeah. In fact, it's the opposite. Yeah. We're literally robbing from the cradle uh, today in order to uh, pay uh, today's bondholders. So we, and we do that by cutting education and, and, and uh, training and, and, and employment opportunities for yeah. tomorrow's um, future workers. Yeah, and we've done, two, we've done something fundamentally that's you know, just so counterproductive, is that we've set it all up so that children are an expense instead of an investment. Now, is there any other, what is the most important investment we have? 
was the children, because without any children, there isn't much left in 100 yeah, years, yeah. except a lot of crotchety old people who can't, <laughs> you know, you can't uh, take care of themselves. Yeah. Okay, and so children are the primary real investment, and yet we've set up, we've set up children as an expense. And you get a young couple just getting jobs, and they're thinking of having children, when they're biologically supposed to be having children, it's like, how are you gonna pay for it? How can you do that? Do you know how much it costs to send this kid to school? You know, oh, okay, maybe we need to wait. They're waiting till they're 30. And the world population is going down. Okay, we're destroying our own species because we've got MMT backwards and we've set children up as an yeah. expense instead of an investment. If we understood that they were an investment, it would be the opposite. We'd have all the institutional incentives, the opposite, yeah. to, to encourage you know, having children and taking care of them because you know, this is the future, right? And to educate them as best we can, and that would be like a, a real priority instead of something you know, that's an expense and, it, and, you know, and it's just going the wrong way. Well, hopefully we can uh, use this institute and some of your ideas uh, yeah. to, to change these ideas around. But look, I, I want to <laughs> thank you. Uh, I know you've got a busy schedule today in New York, but thanks for coming around, talking Good to, to us. Uh, it's been great. And um, this will hopefully get widely disseminated so that we can start this process of re-educating people, particularly on the deficit. So, yeah. Warren, thanks a lot. Okay.